Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bharatiya, and welcome to a special edition of Let's Talk About AI ML for KubeCon. And today we have with us once again, Animesh Singh, CTO of Watson Data and AI Open Source Platform at IBM. Animesh, it's good to see you after such a long time. Thanks, great to meet you as well, um, Swapnil. I, I think last time it was at the Open Source Summit in Vancouver. Uh, you know, uh, it has been quite a while, but you know, glad to, glad to uh, you know, see you again. At the Open Source Summit uh, last week, IBM and Linux Foundation announced the public availability of Machine Learning Exchange, or MLX. Uh, so I want to talk about that. Of course, this is KubeCon here. So there are so many things to talk about. Let's start with MLX. What is it? Yeah, Machine Learning Exchange, right? So this is something which we announced at the Open Source Summit, as you mentioned, in, in Seattle, North America, um, a couple of weeks ago. And it's focused on, you know, being that one single stop, you know, one stop shop for all your data and AI artifacts that includes, you know, your data sets, models, pipelines, notebooks. Uh, one of the things, right, um, which we have noticed is, you know, typically when you look at the ML and AI lifecycle, uh, typically the three most important pillars are data sets, models, and pipelines. And, and you know, you essentially start with a data set and you end with a model and, and in between lies that huge uh, data and AI life cycle where you go through all the different processes like you know data ingestion data cleaning feature engineering and then you know machine learning part of it which is you know you are running distributed training hyperparameter optimization validating your uh, trained models deploying them in production so pipelines essentially become very very important and become that third pillar to actually take you from data to models so machine learning exchange essentially brings all these artifacts, which is data sets, models, pipelines, and notebooks in one single place. And it's not only acts as a marketplace or a central catalog for all these artifacts, it also gives you an execution engine under the covers, right? And by virtue of having that execution engine, you get some added capabilities. So hey, if it is pipelines, you can run those pipelines on top of machine learning exchange. If it is data sets, you can essentially you know, download those data sets on your, on your clusters. If it is models, you can deploy those models, right? So by virtue of being uh, integrated with an execution engine under the covers, uh, you know you get uh, the capability of a central catalog, right? So you are eliminating all the duplication and bifurcation, different teams recreating these assets again and again in different silos, but also because of the execution engine, you get these added services. Yeah, so that was the announcement for them. So as uh, you alluded to the fact that you know, it's part of the LFAI and data, uh, and there are other projects also within the foundation. Uh, can you also talk about uh, IBM's involvement with other projects within AI and data foundation? Uh, sure. Um, so one of the key things, right, for IBM and, and as part of the not only as part of the strategy, right, but also, you know, as, as we have been one of the leaders into the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning space, right, we have consciously been, you know, working towards uh, doing AI in an ethical and trusted way. And that has been, you know, one of the areas where IBM has been mostly focused with Linux Foundation AI and data. In fact, you know, the reason why we joined initially LF AI and data was we wanted to, you know, get together with all these other companies and define not only the principles, in terms of you know building AI in a trusted and ethical way, but also you know uh, drive some tools and technologies and under the aegis of the foundation, so that you know participating member companies can work with us, right? So a lot of these companies are essentially you know working with us, including Microsoft, you know, uh, DARPA, and you know others uh, like Ericsson, AT and T, where we are essentially you know building principles how to build AI in ethical way and also you know, building tools and technology. So as part of that, IBM contributed three open source projects, uh, AI Fairness 360, which is focused on bias detection and mitigation, adversarial robustness uh, toolbox, which essentially, you know, detects uh, adversarial attacks against your models and, you know, figures out if it is vulnerable to adversarial attacks, and AI Explainability 360, which explains your model predictions, right? So these are some of the major three uh, projects in the trusted AI space where we are engaged in. Another area where you know, IBM is heavily engaged in is a project called EJDA, which is in the data set metadata and governance, uh, because we believe you, know, you cannot build trusted and ethical AI unless you have a very strong data governance and data metadata uh, capabilities. So EJDA as a project plays into that space. And there also, you know, we are working with a larger community with companies like ING and others 
to actually you know create that central data set metadata project uh, around that so yeah some of the key projects for us you know ai fairness 360 AI explainability adversarial robustness cjd etc excellent and when we're talking about linux foundation and we're talking about uh, open source summit <laughs> this week it's kubecon and once again ibm is there uh, your presence is there and once again uh, you are making an announcement uh, at this event as well uh, so to so talk about uh, what are you announcing at kubecon uh, and what is it all about? Yes, it's KubeCon this week, and I'm very, very excited. I do have a session in session, essentially, you know, uh, talking about this topic and, you know, uh, using that and leveraging that session to announce. So there are two parts to it, right? So one in general, as uh, you might be aware, right, uh, IBM has been one of the leaders in the Kubeflow community, right? So there was a project in Kubeflow called KF Serving, which was essentially focused on serving machine learning models in production using serverless technologies. So first part of it is, you know, that project has been named to Kser and is moving out of Qflow into its own independent GitHub organization. So essentially, you know, uh, uh, the project has grown and has become, you know, central to a lot of other companies which are working with it on uh, with us, like for example, Bloomberg, Selden, Nvidia, and others. So that is is the first part. But the more uh, importantly, what we are announcing majorly is that we are moving the core of Watson for model serving and management, which is called model mesh into open source, right? And while we are moving it into open source, we are also combining it with KSERV to actually create that one single standard for serving machine learning models in production on top of Kubernetes. So that essentially is the announcement that the core of Watson called model mesh, which is focused on machine learning models in production is essentially being uh, contributed to open source by IBM and being combined with the KSERV project to create that one single standard for machine learning models in production. Yeah, first of all, you, as you said, you know, you're taking the core of Watson and uh, releasing it as open source as model mesh. So I want to understand a bit about, of course, technical and governance aspect of it. So when you're open sourcing it, where will the project be hosted? Model mesh, you know, it has been running in production for Watson, you know, for the last many years, a lot of the Watson APIs like Watson, uh, natural language understanding, what's the speech to text, they're all, you know, running on top of it. And one of the, uh, you know, the major functionalities for Watson Model Mesh has been around, you know, extreme scalability. So it can serve hundreds and thousands of models in production. Essentially, you know, it acts as a distributed LRU cache where, you know, we intelligently, you know, optimize and thousand of models on top of Kubernetes clusters, which are you know very basic in size, and and a lot of the algorithms, etc., which are built into it, are around that fashion, right? To how to optimize compute resources for serving these many models, right? With uh, typically you know millisecond response time, right? Uh, so that's the focus and technical aspects of this project. Now, when we are moving this project out, yes, uh, and moving it in open source. Now, in terms of the governance, the project is something which we are combining with KSERV. Now, if you know about KSER, KSERV essentially, you know, is, is uh, a project which started in the Qflow community. And then, you know, uh, just around two to three weeks ago, uh, we worked with uh, Google and Google has been very gracious in terms of, you know, moving that project out of the Qflow and it has its own independent GitHub organization now. So KSERV is, is you know, being governed according to the same principles and techniques which we were using before, there is, you know, multi-vendor participation in terms of the steering committee, in terms of the bi-weekly meetings, and then Model Mesh is joining that particular project. Now, our goal would be uh, somewhere in fourth quarter, or, or you know, uh, I'm hoping it's fourth quarter that we move this particular combination of these two projects as a single entity into Linux Foundation, right? But that's TBD. Right now, the announcement is focused on Watson Model Mesh is moving in open source and being joined with KSERV. And our goal with that is to create that one single standard uh, for model serving on Kubernetes. Right. Excellent. So there is a lot uh, you know, of updates that will be coming. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. But if I just ask you, uh, there is KSERV community, and then there, I mean, head on all these projects, there are so many communities, there is no single community. But if I ask you, what kind of community are you looking at building or supporting with Model Mesh and, you know, the combination of two projects? Can you talk about that at this point? Or, you know, you look at it at that point when the project is kind of finds a home. Definitely. I mean, as as, as somebody said, uh, Swapnail, open source exists so that, you know, every problem has to be solved only once. Right. And that's our attempt, right? That, that we are not solving this problem of serving machine learning models in production many times. Right now, majority of the companies 
or in the enterprises we work with, and even on public cloud, they have chosen Kubernetes as the underlying cloud operating system, right? And there has been a strong need for emerging standards on top of Kubernetes for serving machine learning models in production. Not only serving machine learning models in production, but you know, being able to monitor and generate those trusted AI metrics we talked about, right? Once your machine learning models are running, are they giving predictions which are unbiased? You know, can you explain model predictions, right? So there is this whole aspect of monitoring and metrics with the model serving platform itself as well, right? So our community and our goal with this uh, project and these set of projects is essentially, you know, to create that single standardized layer on top of Kubernetes for serving and monitoring machine learning models in production. Now, one of the things which has already happened, uh, you know, KSERV has essentially started a protocol, what we call, you know, V2 protocol for machine learning inferencing, which has already started becoming a standard, right? So NVIDIA's Triton, um, you know, server essentially follows that standard uh, for model prediction and inferencing API. So we call the V2 protocol. Celadon's ML server, that also follows that particular standard, right? So if you are writing applications which are talking to these V2 protocol APIs, you are essentially, you know, aligned not only with KServe and model mesh, but, you know, NVIDIA's Triton NT server, Celadon's ML server, Facebook's uh, PyTorch TorchServe, right? So TorchServe is an engine, right, which serves PyTorch models. That is also aligning around that standard and exposes the V2 protocol APIs for model inferencing, right? So the standardization effort already started heavily on that side, right, with KServe. And now with model mesh coming in, it is filling that gap that, you know, you need to now not only serve, you know, uh, like I would say hundreds of models in production, but now hundreds and thousands of models in production, because what we realized over the course of last year and a half was that, you know, more and more models started moving in production. So at some level, the KServe architecture, which is, you know, natively tied to Kubernetes started imposing some of the limitations in terms of the scalability, because when you map a model on a per container basis, uh, there are limitations you, you have where how many containers you can run on a cluster, how many IP addresses can be assigned to those clusters, right? To address a lot of those limitations, model mesh is coming and filling that big gap where essentially, yes, it's still running on Kubernetes, but it's not mapping a model to a container. And by virtue of using its distributed LRU cache and algorithms under the covers, it's able to serve hundreds and thousands of these models now on a similar compute cluster. If you look at today's, uh, since we are here at uh, KubeCon, if you look at the world is, it was running on Linux, then open source, and now everything is using Kubernetes as much capacity or other. And then we do talk about the whole stack of cloud, um, whether we talk about security or any other aspect, of course, we can use AIML in a lot of other ways as well, but AIML is going to play a much more bigger role than it used to play. So will it be wrong to say that just the way at some point we said, hey, no, you need to have a digital transformation or cloud strategy. You need to have a software strategy. You cannot run a business. Will it be wrong to say that you should have an AI ML strategy as well if you want to be a successful business in the modern times? Because without that, all the way from security or whatever metrics you are collecting, whether to get better insights or if you're building an AI ML based solution itself, like Tesla cars or whatever it is. So, so, so it's a just high level question that I'm asking you, what is the role of AIML in modern you know, world when you're building your stack? You're definitely right. I mean, in fact, you know, I think the trend we are seeing is, you know, majority of the organizations have already started taking steps in that direction, right? Where if you see just in general, in terms of the job posting around, you know, the, the amount of companies which are either building an AI and machine learning based strategy and by virtue of that strategy, you know, the underlying platform to, to create and, and serve these models in production, but also, you know, the whole data science capability where they are now focusing a lot of emphasis that, hey, yes, we had a lot of data, but there was no data engineering around it. We were not creating data lakes. We were not doing feature engineering. We were not doing data cleansing because this data is a source of a lot of knowledge and we can actually harness that with the available technologies which are now there to actually make meaningful predictions for our businesses, right, which can help grow the business, right? So I think that trend is already on, more and more it's catching up. And now, you know, you see another layer which is coming up is like the traditional cloud uh, functions or the traditional IT functionals, right? For example, you talked about security, DevOps. We are seeing, you know, a lot of the, the companies are now investing AI-driven security, right? How do you actually use AI to make your 
uh, security portfolio more robust, more strong, more predictive in nature? How do you actually use AI to, to you know, build DevOps pipelines so that it can predict when your data centers, machines are uh, you know, going to fail, when the network bandwidth is going to clog, or you know, when the capacity of these machines. So they're leveraging AI in, in you know, automation. Now they're leveraging AI in, in DevOps. They're leveraging AI in security. So I think the trend is, you know, until this far, there was a huge advent of, you know, the, the tools and technologies, how to build AI. And now we are seeing, you know, how to infuse AI, which is how to use AI to, to uh, into other layers of the organization and the technologies which we have. Animesh, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about, of course, uh, I, I look at this, the, uh, this as a, a journey of the projects that are happening at IBM. Uh, and of course, as you mentioned, those projects will be taking shape soon. So I'll, you know, Keep an eye on that, and I would love to have you back on the show when uh, the the Kisser model mesh, you know, something is finalized there. But thanks for uh, your time today, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, thanks a lot, Swapnil. Thanks for having me here. Right, and always exciting to talk to you. Right, on on this journey uh, which we are taking uh, in open source with a lot of these AI projects. Right, and as and uh, you know, as a part of. Uh, going, uh, I would like to say that you know our focus within IBM has always been around you know building AI in a trusted and ethical way, and a lot of these uh, projects which you are seeing, whether it's machine learning exchange, which you know focuses a lot on the data lineage, uh, data governance, you know having certified artifacts which are there, or you know with model mesh bringing in a lot of these capabilities uh, with model mesh and KServe around uh, not only serving machine learning models in production but also being able to explain model predictions, detect whether the model predictions are biased against a particular group, right? We have always been very conscious of, you know, doing these things uh, in a very ethical way and also, you know, creating AI in a trusted and ethical way. So thanks for having me here.